You've been searching for the best way to generate passive income in your life and heard that real estate is a great way to do it. But you're tired of all the so-called gurus who are all talk and no substance. Get ready to celebrate because Kevin Buck has spent 14 years successfully making it happen. This is the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Now, here's Kevin Buck. Hey guys, Kevin Buck here with episode number 179 of the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. Now, before I introduce our guest for today's show, I want to mention a very important item regarding this show, and that's, uh, and I've actually mentioned this a few other times over the past month or so, in that we've got a few episodes that are, they're called, that they were lost in the archives, okay? They were, they kind of slipped through the cracks. Well, um, this is one of those episodes. I've got a number of them coming up over the coming months. Uh, these pretty much got lost in my archives. Don't ask me how, but they did. And uh, some of them are a year, year and a half old, and they're awesome interviews. They're awesome shows that were meant for your ears many, many months ago, some, some over a year ago, but they didn't make it out. Well, now I'm slowly releasing them out to the world, out to you so that you guys can extra, extract the value from them because there's some awesome shows that I did. And uh, today's show is one of them. And uh, our guest for today's show is real estate and historical multifamily expert, Michael Seeker. Now, at, I, w- I want to apologize as well. One other thing I want to mention is, as you can tell, my voice is a little hoarse and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting uh, my butt kicked by allergies this season. And so if I sound a little weird and a little awkward, that's why. Um, I pretty much lost my voice a week ago and I'm barely getting it back now. And so it's a little bit of a struggle for me to do this show, but I wanted to make sure that I got it out for you guys this week. And so First and foremost, about today's guest, again, Michael Seeker is our guest today. Uh, First and foremost, one of the most important things that you need to take notice of is that not only does Michael have a full-time job, but he also lives over a thousand miles away from the market that he invests in. And I only bring this up because there are many excuses that one can make as to why they aren't currently investing in real estate. And being busy with a full-time job and living far away from an ideal market are two of the top excuses that I often hear. Well, listen in as Michael shares with you how he does it. I mean, exactly how he does it and much, much more. And so in this show with Michael, you're going to learn the following. You're going to learn how Michael got started as a real estate investor shortly after the crash of 2008 with practically zero experience. You'll learn how he's been able to balance a full-time career while simultaneously scaling a successful real estate business. You'll learn why he chooses to invest solely in the Louisville, Kentucky market, more specifically, the historic homes that exist in Louisville. You'll learn why he prefers to keep his property management in-house. You'll learn how he utilizes historical tax credit programs to recoup a significant portion of the rehab costs on the various historical renovations. You'll learn how he structures partnerships with his passive investors. You'll learn how he uses direct mail to find most of his opportunities and much, much more. And so I'm very excited to get onto the show with Michael. But before we do, I do have a few important items I'd like to run through with you guys. Uh, First and foremost, which I've been mentioning now for the last couple of months, is that uh, I like to say that we're open for business. And what that means is that we are in buying mode and we would like to purchase more mobile home parks. And in case you didn't know, in case you weren't aware, that is our business. That's what I specialize in. I've owned many other types of commercial real estate and residential real estate over the years. But for the past five or six years, we have specialized and focused in mobile home parks. And so if while you're out there on the hunt looking for the particular type of real estate that you're looking for, if you run across a mobile home park opportunity that seems interesting, please think of me. You can shoot me an email directly, kevin at kevinbup.com. And I will tell you that we're open to buying nationwide. Uh, We do have some criteria. I don't want to spend too much time going through it here on the show. Uh, But the basic criteria is that we're looking for mobile home parks that are a minimum of 60 lots in size, meaning that there's 60 spaces in the mobile home community or more. Okay. And so if you come across something that seems rather interesting, uh, not necessarily something that's listed on LoopNet or CoStar, because we've probably seen it, uh, but something that's off market that you run across, you can shoot me an email, kevin at kevinbup.com. And uh, we can handle deals as large as $25 million, even higher than that. And uh, we can handle portfolio deals. So not just those single individual deals, we can handle multiple package deals as well. Okay. Uh, We pay very large referral fees. 
Uh, and we're also open to partnering as well. So maybe you would like to try to take it down, but you need a partner with experience, a track record, and some capital to back you up. We're open to that, or we're open to just putting a very fat referral paycheck in your pocket, okay? So again, Kevin at KevinUp.com if you've got an opportunity you'd like to discuss. Um, Next up, guys, I want to mention uh, about our mobile home park number two fund that is coming out. Uh, again, I've been mentioning for the last couple of weeks or months on the show, uh, we, we closed out a very successful uh, mobile home park fund uh, that started last March. and We just closed it out uh, this past month, and uh, we purchased five mobile home parks in that fund. We are launching a new fund, a second fund, uh, here literally in the next 30 days, okay? Um, so if you have an interest and you didn't make it in the first fund, we, we closed it out. We turned a lot of people away on that first fund. Please go to our website, sunrisecapitalinvestors.com, and create a free account inside our investment portal. This will basically put you on the first to know basis for when fund number two rolls out. We're expecting this thing to close out pretty quickly. We've got some awesome opportunities that are currently in contract, as well as a ton of opportunities in the pipeline. We are ramping it up really heavy in our marketing efforts, um, and we literally are. are just, we've got a lot of deal flow coming our way. Lots of really, really strong opportunities. So if you'd like to partner with us on those and participate and be a part of our team, please, again, go to sunrisecapitalinvestors.com and uh, go ahead and, and, and get enrolled into our investor portal. Okay, It takes literally less than five minutes and you'll be put on the first to know basis when the next opportunity rolls out. Uh, next up, guys, if you happen to be in the Tampa Bay area, that's where I'm based out of. I'm based in Clearwater, Florida. Um, feel free to reach out to me. I love, I love meeting others that share the same passion as I do of real estate. You can, again, shoot me an email, kevin at kevinbup.com. Let me know when you're coming into town and and we'll see if we can coordinate our schedules to get together. And so, guys, without further ado, I'd like to get to the part of the show that you've been waiting for, which is our interview with Michael Seeker. So here we go. All right, guys, today on the show, we are thrilled to be joined by a real estate investment expert, Michael Seeker. Michael is the founder and president of Renting502.com, a company that specializes in acquiring and renovating distressed small multifamily properties in the Louisville, Kentucky market. Michael got a start in real estate a short time ago, back in 2009, while working as an actuary and hasn't looked back since. So without further ado, let's welcome Michael Seeker to the show. Michael, how are you doing today? Doing well. Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to, to be with you here today and to chat with you a little bit about your business. And just before we get started here, Michael, uh, first off, where are, we, where are we calling you at? Where, uh, you know, where are you based out of right now? I'm in uh, Cape Coral, Florida, which is probably just a couple hours south of you, right near Fort Myers. Okay, okay, good deal. And it sounds uh, as we were talking before we started recording here, you're uh, you're about to take a road trip as soon as this uh, interview is finished, and you're you're heading out of Cape Coral and you're heading north, and you don't know where you're going to end up. Yet, yeah, that's pretty cool. That's exciting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're we're taking off, and we're going to check out a few different cities that um, that are kind of on our short list of, of where we might want to live longer term. We're just going to go see what fits with okay. for, for us. Fantastic. Well, Michael, here in the beginning of the show, I, I, what I'd like to do is just hand the mic back to you for a few minutes and have you fill in our listeners a little bit more about yourself, your background, and, and how you got into the real estate business. Sure. Um, so I'll kind of go all the way back. I, I grew up in the Midwest, um, you know, very non-entrepreneurial parents and, and family, but um, both my, my parents were divorced with so both my mom and my dad were very um, handy and, and kind of do it yourself type people. So I, I got all kinds of different um, remodeling projects and things that I was involved in um, from a very young age and, and also got to see um, my aunt and uncle uh, renovated a, an old historic Victorian home um, up near Chicago, Illinois. And so I got to kind of see the progress of, of that project and really, um, you know, I never, as a kid, it never really clicked. But it was something that I always enjoyed about kind of working with my hands and getting to see the, the transformation of, of a rundown property or, or bedroom or whatever it may have been um, transformed into, into something pretty awesome. Um, so I, as I got a little bit older and, and got into college, I kind of, you know, it was back in the uh, 05, 06, 07, where, um, you know, everybody and their mom was in real estate in, in one capacity or another. Um, and I, I started trying to talk my, my father into um, partnering or, or buying a um, house for myself to live in and, and some friends and we could pay rent and all that. Um, he, he wasn't really interested in the idea. And so you know, I kind of went back and forth with him a, a few different times and never was really able to talk him into it. 
Um, but then when I graduated from college, I kind of knew right out of the gate that um, I, I really wanted to give real estate a go um, and, and see if I could make it work. And so you know, I started out with a full-time job, um, working as a, an actuary in the healthcare arena. Um, and really from day one, you know, my plan was I'm going to, I'm going to go out and, and flip a house and then I'm going to flip another one and I'm going to do enough of these to where I can quit my day job and, uh, and, and live happily ever after. Um, luckily I, I started all that in, in 2009. So, um, it wasn't, wasn't quite the bottom of the market yet. Um, but a lot of the pain that, that had already been felt was, um, you know, was already behind us. So. Uh, it was a pretty good entry point and um, really a good time to kind of jump in and, and get my feet wet and um, figure out what the heck to do. So after, um, uh, you know, a string of, uh, I, I did a live-in rehab to start off. Um, then I, I moved to um, buying a multifamily property with a partner uh, and living in that while renting out my, my single family home. Um, I also flipped a couple houses on the side and, and kind of through all of that, um, hard experience and, and uh, school of hard knocks. I, I kind of came out on the back end, um, really having a, a, a passion and a interest in, um, you know, really renovating and, and renting out historic uh, properties, primarily, you know, the area that I know is Louisville. Um, so that kind of takes, takes us to where I'm at today, which is um, I'm, I'm investing remotely. Obviously I live in South Florida, but um still continuing to build my team and, and build the uh, holdings that I have in Louisville um, and, and really have every intent to continue doing that with, with more uh, small multi-team projects there. Okay. And ha- tell me how that works with you being remote like that. And, uh, you know, h- how have you been able to continually grow your portfolio with you being in Florida now and you're about to get on the road on a road trip and travel here for a few weeks probably. And uh, how have you guys been able, I mean, how have you been able to grow your business and continually bring deals through the door being remote like that? And that's a that's a good question. Um, you know, it hasn't hasn't really been easy. Um, luckily, I had kind of the the um, benefit of of working remotely with my full time job for about three years before um, actually leaving Louisville and, and kind of becoming a remote investor. So, um, the, the company that I was working for at the time kind of gave me a free trial run at, at you know working remotely, dealing with folks completely on the phone and, and via email. Um, so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a terribly difficult transition, but there's, there's certainly a lot of, uh, trials and tribulations with any kind of big transition like that. Um, it, you know, the biggest thing is really having, having, you know, contractors and, and, um, contacts and a team that, that support you. And so I've been lucky enough to build up, um, a pretty good Rolodex of folks in the Louisville area. Um, and, and also, you know, I've got a, a, a partner, um, really, it was kind of a mentor type situation, contract type situation um, with, a, with a guy in Louisville who was interested in getting into um, real estate investing. He's really kind of grown and, and progressed and, and our chemistry is very good. So we've actually partnered on a deal and um, kind of looking to, to expand his responsibility and um, leverage his, his proximity to all the properties as best I can. Okay, so he can be the boots on the ground guy because I mean, it's if you're gonna you know grow your your portfolio in a big way and you're gonna be active in that marketplace, but you're not gonna live there, then I would think that you'd have to have some type of boots on the ground guy. And it sounds like you have him, or at least you're working on putting him in, into that role. So that's that's good. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, and I did. Um, you know, I, I tried out the uh, property management route um, for the first few months, uh, and it, it really just isn't uh, doesn't doesn't jive with with kind of how I run things. You know, I like to, I like to have a feel for the financials. I like to understand what's going on, where the money's going, why, you know, I'm, I'm why something was uh, causing me some, some loss in revenue in a certain month. Um, and most, most management companies really don't want owners that actually care about their property. they they prefer the, the uh, folks that say, here's the keys, you know, send me a check at the end of the year with a summary and, um, that's just not, not how I operate and not how I would uh, feel comfortable leaving, you know, leaving my keys to somebody that, that wants to operate like that. Sure. Well, you're an actuary. So, I mean, that's, I mean, you're by nature, you're an analytical guy and, and you want to know the hard, hard facts. And, uh, if you're dealing with a property yeah. management company that's not willing to give those to you, then 
that relationship obviously isn't going to work out too well. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So tell me about it. Are you guys involved in any projects right now? I mean, do you have any uh, acquisitions that are, that are currently in the pipeline or something that you've just recently closed on? Yeah. Yeah. We actually um, just closed on probably one of the more interesting deals that I've done in the past five or six years. Um, it, it's, it's kind of a long backstory, but um, the, the first decent sized multi that I bought um, was a, a six unit property. And, um, you know, I spent probably about two years, um, really mostly with my own blood, sweat and tears, fixing the place up, um, getting, you know, moving the, the, the section eight and, and drug dealing tenants out and, and kind of turning the building around, um, towards, towards the end of that process, I, I noticed, you know, a couple of buildings on the block that were in, in rough shape. And I, I thought, you know, I'll send a letter to this guy and see, um, if, if he'd have any interest in selling. So I think that was back in 2013. I, I mailed a letter out to the guy and said, you know, Hey, I'm a local investor. I own the building three, three places down, yada, yada, yada. Um, funny thing is the, the owner um, passed away probably about six to eight months ago and, uh, his, his children or child that was, you know, the executor of his estate came across this letter that he'd saved um, and gave me a call or shot me an email and, uh, you know, pushed, we kind of went back and forth quite a bit on, on this particular property and ended up, um, buying two properties from them to, to make the deal work. And, uh, so now we're, we're undertaking a pretty significant, um, renovation there and I'm pretty excited about the, the prospects for it. And how big of a property is that? Or, or it's two properties. So how many total units? Yeah. So one, uh, the, the property that I initially reached out for is a three unit, uh, property. And these are all it, kind of in, it, to give a little context to some of the folks that aren't familiar with Louisville or, or the area that I'm talking about. Uh, this is a historic district and, and pretty much everything that's a rental is, uh, is an old historic Victorian type building that somewhere around the fifties or sixties got chopped up into multiple apartments. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a kind of niche area. And, and what I love about it is there's really no opportunity for uh, new competition. The, the density is um, constantly decreasing in, in the neighborhood. It's, you know, nobody can go in and build a new uh, 200 unit complex there. Cause it's just not, not worth the hassle and not yeah. something that would get approved. Okay. Good deal. Um, so that, yeah, that's a, that's a threeplex. And then the other one's a, a four unit property also in a pretty good part of Louisville. Um, just, just due to financials and, and it not really fitting with all the other property that we own, we're actually going to, uh, sell that one. We're, we're kind of doing a little bit of initial cleanup and then we're going to look to wholesale it probably to another investor that might be interested in that area a little more. Okay. Why well, is it, is it a rougher area? Uh, actually, it's a little bit nicer of an area. Um, the, the reason I really don't, uh, you know, like I said before, there's, there's some financial constraints, but, um, really the, the, the price, uh, uh what the, the price of buildings in that area command for the rent that they bring in, um, just isn't really appealing to me. So, um, you know, we could, we could keep the building and, and clean it up a little bit, but, um, really it's, it's best use is to get it into the hands of an investor that, um, wants to do that work and then either sell it to, to, you know, convert it to a single family home or, um, uh, maybe sell it to another investor that wants to hold on to it long term. Okay, is it completely empty right now? The four unit that you guys are thinking of flipping, or is it actually occupied with? It? Um, it, it, yeah. So this uh, this particular property, the uh, the guy that passed away actually occupied two of the units, um, and then we're in the process of uh, of moving the, the folks in the other two units out. They were just grossly under rented for the for the area. Um, so rather than trying to work with them or raise rents or sell the building with, with tenants in place that are, you know, paying peanuts. We decided to, um, you know, give them some, some incentive to move out and then just kind of clean up the building as best we could before we sell it. Okay. So before you guys sell it, you don't think you'll go in and actually re-rent it and get occupied? No, no. Oh, okay. No, it's definitely, um, you know, we could, we could attempt to do that, but I, I really think it's a property that has a lot more potential if somebody goes in and does some work to it. Okay. Um, and really that's not feasible if, if 
you want to move tenants in, there's, yeah. there's really not much to do at that point. Okay. So. so let's talk about the Victorian you're going to keep. I, I just want to get a take on like what you guys look for and what you uh, deem an opportunity. And so tell me about the, the three unit Victorian and give me some numbers like, you know, the acquisition price. Um, is it fully occupied now or, you know, the rents below market, you know, like give me kind of the opportunity that you guys saw, give me the big picture of it. Absolutely. So, um, this particular building is, is vacant. It was completely vacant. Um, when we purchased it and when we were looking to buy it, um, the, the intent there is that, you know, it's, it's in pretty rough shape. Um, but as I mentioned before, it's, it's a couple doors down from, um, a property that I already own. And I actually have a couple others, um, really within maybe 300 yards of this particular building. So I know the, I know the area very well. Um, I know what the rents will be and, and all that good stuff. Um, but this particular building is just, it, it, it needs the work done to it. It's, um, you know, it, it, it had been neglected for, for a very long time. Um, so what, what we're going to do, you know, we bought the building uh, along, in conjunction with this other one. Um, we're going to sell the other one to kind of raise some additional funds to do a full rehab on this. And we're, we're taking the building down to the studs. Um, you know, hired a, a, an architect to draw out a floor, floor plans for us and um, really, you know, starting over from scratch and rebuilding everything brand new how we want it. Wow. That's a big project. <laughs> so is, so when is. you say down to the studs, I mean, uh, assuming it's a, it was probably built back in the early 1900s, is, are you going to have to do a rewiring mm-hmm. as well? Yeah. Yep. So the building's being all new electric, all new plumbing, um, new HVAC, you name it. it it's going to be essentially a brand new building with uh, 1900 um, bones in it. So, wow. Uh, okay. It, it's it's going to have a lot of that old character. It's going to have the tall ceilings, fireplaces, that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to have to worry about the, the electric shorting out and bring the building down or uh, that pesky plumbing leak somewhere on the third floor that, that leaks all the way down to the basement for years and years. Yep. Okay. So it's three units. Give me an idea of, of what your total cost is going to be. You got your acquisition price, but then you got your rehab costs in there. What are you going to be looking at? What are you going to be into this thing for at the very end once you're said and done? So we'll be all into it for about 245 grand. Um, now that the, the interesting piece, and this is something that I'm, I'm getting more familiar with, um, with another similar recent project, uh, but we're actually going to be able to recoup a, a good chunk of that with historic tax credits. Um, since it is a ho- historic building in a historic district, um, there's a, a lot of incentive to um, preserve those buildings. And so um, we, we should be able to recoup somewhere around 20 to 40 percent of the um, rehabilitation costs. Hmm. So we're going to put about $200,000 into it um, and we should get somewhere in the range of 40 to 80 grand back. Wow. Okay. Um, so, so, and, and that, that's what I like to kind of consider the icing on the cake. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't jump into a deal like this and, and bank on, on those tax credits to, to make it work. Um, but at the, you know, so at the end of the day, we'll have 245,000 into it. Um, the, the units themselves will, will probably bring in around 900 to a thousand a piece. Um, so we're talking around 2,700 to 3,000, um, and, you know, we've already got the financing secured on it. Um, it, it we have a construction to permanent loan. So um, we kind of know what we're going to be looking at uh, as far as the, um, you know, the monthly outlay that we're going to have to cover as well as the expenses and such. Um, so it's, it's really shaping up to be a pretty, um, pretty exciting deal. Okay. And in a building like that, what do you do with regards to utilities? I'm assuming it's uh, city utilities, so it's city water, city sewer. Is the uh, is the water yep. going to have its own separate meter or that be included in the rent or you know, I'm, I'm you know, those old buildings, I mean, how do they chop those things up because originally it was a single family home, which means it only had one meter right, for each. Right. So how do you guys yeah, do so will, the, you, will you guys go in and build that build the utility usage back? That's a good question. Um, typically what's done in, in this market and what I do for all my buildings is the water is included in in the rent. No, you know, no tenants don't pay extra for that. There's no rubs or anything like that. Um, you know, sewer obviously is the same thing. Trash is included in the taxes, so I always market it that trash is included. Just you know, maybe for somebody moving out of town that doesn't know that. But um, then for a lot of the buildings in this area, you know, you get a mix of some that are um, commonly metered, where you know you've got one electric meter or. Um, sometimes you've got one electric meter and 
um, you know, one gas meter or however it may be. Um, all the properties that, that I own and everything that I would be interested in are all separately electric metered. So I don't, I don't take on any of that risk of, of the tenant, you know, potentially leaving the windows open and running their feet all winter. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, I, I had a buddy that, that actually did that, you know, he did be 30 degrees outside and he'd have his windows and, and sliding door open because the, the, everybody else in the building was cranking their heat and his apartment was too hot. And I just saw that. I'm like, man, you know, whoever runs this place is just, they're literally throwing money out the window right yeah. now. Yep. Interesting. Okay. So, so, so to this day, I guess the biggest unit that you've borrowed, biggest property you purchased was the six unit property. Have you guys made any considerations uh, with going towards anything larger than a six unit? Um, yeah, yeah, we have. I actually um, was really aggressively trying to purchase a, a mixed use building um, on the same exact block as these two were talking about. Um, it, it consisted of, I think it was six or eight commercial spaces and uh, 10 um, one bedroom apartments. Um, that, that was something that I was very, very interested in. Um, but unfortunately I wasn't able to get the, the financing for the construction component of it. So I, I found a bank and a lender that was willing to, um, shell out the cash to buy the place, but they, they didn't want to have anything to do with the, the construction part of it. What kind uh, of, what kind of construction some, did I mean, it need? Was it, was it, was it mostly vacant and it needed a major rehab done to it or? Um, it, it was probably 50% occupied and, okay. and it was, um, you know, similar, similar to what I was talking about before, kind of very, very low income transient type, um, tenants that, you know, you're really not going to get, in my mind, it was, you know, complete gut and rehab type deal where you move all the existing folks out, um, kind of incentivize them to, to go find somewhere else to live or, or do business and then, um, start, start back over from square one. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what excites so, you about uh, yeah, the, or go ahead, go ahead. Didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, we're, we're definitely open to, to bigger projects, but, um, you know, in, in the particular neighborhoods that we're looking at, there's not a lot of, um, older buildings that are, that were built that large unless they were specifically for commercial or, or multifamily purposes. And, um, so they're, they're fewer and far between and it's harder to make the numbers work on them. Okay. So, and you guys are really focused on the, this historical area because number one, there's a big barrier to entry with, you know, you don't have to worry about the mm -hmm. risk of a developer coming in and, and creating competition for you by adding units to the market. But what are the other reasons that you really like that, that particular market? Well, so the, the, um, the particular part of Louisville that I focused on is actually wedged right between the university of Louisville and downtown. So, okay. um, the, the, a lot of the housing there, it, it drives a lot of demand for students as well as young professionals, um, which is really a demographic that, that I like to rent to. That they're they're technology, technologically savvy. Um, you know, I, I text all my tenants back and forth. I don't, I don't get the 3 a.m. phone calls. Um, everything's done by email and text message. Um, and, and they pay their rent on time. You know, these are folks that are... Um, you know, they've got kind of their whole life ahead of them and, and they don't want to start it off with a bull mission of yep. eviction or, or, you know, even, even if they're a little rough around the edges, usually their parents are um, involved enough to, to keep them, you know, out of that type of situation. So I've really had good success with um, very low occupancy and, and very, you know, almost non-existent issues as far as uh, rent collection goes. Mm -hmm. Great, great. And, and tell me what your exit looks like. Do you guys have an exit strategy? I mean, are you guys planning on holding these things for 20, 30, 40 years, or do you see that you would exit out of them sometime in the future? You know, I, I, I don't have a, a particular um, planned exit, so to speak. Um, okay. You know, I think with, with some, of the, some of the properties I own on my own and some are with partnerships, um, in, in the partnership arrangements, I kind of leave that open. You know, if, if somebody has a, a need or a desire to exit out, I'm, I'm certainly open to um, doing that uh, uh, however they want. And that could either be with me, um, you know, purchasing their share of it, or we, we go out to the market and see what um, what we can sell it for. But um, really, the, the, the you know, with doing some of the rehabbing and, and single-family house flips, um, you know, I, I got very well educated on the, on the uh, pitfalls of selling stuff. You've got to deal with, um, a, an agent who wants their 6%. You've got to deal with a buyer who, um, you know, doesn't, they're, they're going to go through and nitpick every little thing that, you know, the tenants might not care that, um, the electric meter on the house is 30 years old, but a buyer might, 
mm-hmm. you know, come back after an inspection and say, well, I want, you know, $10,000 off the, off the sale price. And, um, then at the end of the day, you've got uncle Sam taking you yeah. know, anywhere from 20 to 30% of, of, of whatever you're making on it. So, right. um, you know, I, I don't really have any intention to, to exit. Um, I think as, as I get closer to maybe uh, about 29 and a half years down the road, once the uh, depreciation runs out, I might um, look more aggressively into uh, some 1031 exchange type um, transactions. But really, I'm I'm kind of focused on building up a, a self-sustaining portfolio in that area, um, and, and then you know potentially moving on to replicate that in, in other parts of Louisville or other cities around the country. Okay. Uh, do you think at some point in time you'll actually uh, look to quit your full time job and just do this full time? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, because uh, well, you know, I, I ask it from a standpoint of you know, some people absolutely hate their job and they hate the career that they're in, and so like their primary focus and energy is put towards building their real estate business to the size that is it's scalable and it's sustainable for them to actually replace their full time income. But if you like what you mm-hmm. do for a living, then it's not really considered a job, right? And so if you like what you do for a living, you make yeah. good money and you can still invest in real estate on the side and still create a, a pretty significant size portfolio, then, but if you can do that all sustainably all together, then why would you quit your job, right? If you really like what you do. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, when I got into, into real estate investing, um, that, that certainly was my motivation out of the gate. You know, I thought I'm going to fold some houses. I'm going to quit my job here in a year or two and, and kind of be this real estate mogul. Um, as I've kind of grown and, and shifted gears as far as the types of investments that I'm doing, um, and, and also grown within my professional career, um, I, I've really found kind of a, a, a nice mix between the two different focuses. You know, my, um, my, my real estate development work has really helped propel me in my professional career. Um, and vice versa, a lot of the professional work that I do is helped out tremendously with my real estate work. Mm-hmm. Um, at, at the end of the day, the biggest, probably the biggest thing that, that has ever worked in my favor was, you know, it was probably going on three or four years ago now where I kind of had enough rental income coming in um, consistently to where I could cover all my expenses and, and not have to worry about anything probably ever again. Um, at, at that point, I was able to kind of take a look at my career and say, what, you know, what kind of jobs do I want to do? What, you know, who do I want to work for? Um, so I've been really lucky and fortunate that, you know, I, I can um, be more flexible in the types of opportunities professionally that I go after. Um, and, and what that's created is really a, a, a series of, of different roles that are really challenging, engaging, um, and that I enjoy doing. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, some, someday that might not be the case, but, but uh, for now, you know, I really enjoy the work that I do. Um, for, for the company that I work for, uh, it, it doesn't feel like a job I, you know, I don't have a boss breathing down my neck all day and, and, um, you know, a lot of stress points. So, um, it, it's where I'm at now, you know, I, I don't know, five years from now, I might, might change my mind, but, um, you know, it's a good mix. Right at now. the end, at the end of the day, you have the flexibility, right? That is, that's the, the beautiful thing about the whole scenario is you really do have the flexibility. And, and as you continue to grow your portfolio, it will make it a lot easier for you to make that decision should that decision come into your mind, right? That, you know, should I quit my job? I don't really like it much yeah. anymore. Like, well, I've got enough income to replace and, to, you know, to replace this income and I can live on it comfortably and not have to worry about anything. And you can make that decision, which I think that's, it's just such a relieving feeling knowing that you've got that alternate source of, of revenue coming into your life each and every month without failure. And then that doesn't count the, the equity that you have on the back end, right? I mean, there's an icing on the cake in most scenarios when, when you own rental real estate, right? And so I like only talking about cash flow because that's real money. It's spendable today. Yep. And appreciation exactly. is just, you know, if it's there, if it's there at the end of the day when it's time to sell, then then fantastic. But it, it is kind of nice to know that that is potentially like a gift at the end of the road, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Would you, yeah, I'd like to talk to you a little bit, uh, Michael, if you're okay with it, uh, about your partnership structure, because, you know, we, we've got a broad range of listeners that tune into our show. We've got those that are just getting started in the multifamily side of things, and we've got those that are pretty sophisticated and, you know, might, might own hundreds or thousands of units. And so, but I really want to speak a little bit mm-hmm. to those that might just be getting started or maybe doing their first couple of deals. You know, one of the big questions a lot of them have is about partnership structure. You know, 
and, and how they structure it. You know, who gets what amount of equity, who gets what amount of debt, um, you know, who has what roles. And so can you kind of give us a just a 10,000 foot view of what your maybe one of your partnership structures looks like? I mean, what your role is, what your partner's role is and, you know, uh, who brought money to the table, who didn't bring money and kind of you know, just give me a general mm-hmm. idea of what that looks like. Sure, sure. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of give you a, a view of, of one of the partnerships um, where the partners are pretty much silent in, in the um, ongoing of the business. So um, it, this was a, kind of an arrangement where, you know, I, I met some folks that were looking to invest in Louisville. Um, and I kind of just raised my hand and said, you know, I'm, I'm here. I, I know the market. Um, let me know if I can help you at all. And, and that turned into a conversation about a, a building they were looking at, um, which progressed into a conversation of, uh, you know, w- would you be interested in managing it for us? And I said, absolutely not. Um, but I'd be happy to partner with you. You know, I, I, there's no way I'd care about your building enough if I don't own half of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and from there, we really, you know, kind of, kind of ironed out what, what made sense as far as a partnership arrangement. Um, for that particular arrangement, um, it, you know, is all my all my partnerships are, are 50-50. I own half of it, um, and then the, the part the other partner or partners own half of it. Um, and I I wouldn't really feel comfortable owning any less than half, just because I you know I I want to be able to know what's going on and, and control what's going on and have some say in the matter. Yep. Um, so so this particular partnership, um, they they put the money in. Um, to, to buy the deals and I go out and, you know, source the deal, um, source the financing. Um, I, we're actually both personally guaranteed on, on the loans. So I do have some sort of, uh, you know, financial uh, stake in it, but, um, they, they put up all the cash for it. And then, um, you know, I, I manage it day to day. I run everything. Um, and they get, they get their statements and, and cash flow is needed. Um, and everything's 50-50. The, the income that we generate split in half, the, um, you know, upside on the back end, if and when we ever decide to sell is, is 50-50. So um, that, that's a, one example, uh, and, and that partnership's been very fruitful. It's worked very well for, for both parties. Mm-hmm. And in that scenario, do they also get a preferred return on their capital that they have into it? No, I mean, that's a good question. I, I heard that come up in a, a previous podcast you had, and um, you know, I, I could see where that would that would make sense and, and might be needed to incentivize somebody. Um, that wasn't, you know, that's not part of our arrangement. And I think probably for for the folks listening on the phone uh, or, or on the podcast, rather, um, you know, if, if you're trying to do some sort of partnership, take a step back and look at what you have to offer. Um, and, and kind of figure out what it's worth. And then, you know, when you go to talk to somebody uh, about partnering with you, um, figure out what they're comfortable doing. You know, are they, cause, cause some people that, you know, may be very seasoned and diligent investors are going to say, you know, I want, I want this type of return on my cash. I want this part ownership. I want this, 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 and this, and, and give you a whole laundry list of wants. Um, but y- you know, you really have to step back and, and understand that it's a, a really a negotiation at the end of the day. Um, you, you want to be a partner with this person. You want to be on the same page as them. And um, so it's, it's important to figure out terms and structure that fit for you and fit for them as well. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's good advice. And yeah, what we typically do is we try to, you know, we, we, we try to back into the number of what, you know, what we think our competition might be offering out there in terms of like, normally we have more sophisticated investors come to us, you know, typically they're accredited. And so they're, Mm-hmm. They're somewhat experienced passive investors, and so they know what kind, kind of what the market should bring based on the uh, the amount of risk associated with whatever type of asset you know um, you know their investors are investing. Like for us, it's mobile home parks, and you know we we buy in good stable markets and we buy quality mobile home parks, but it's still um, they're not A grade assets. I mean, a lot of ours are like B minus grade mm-hmm. assets, and so uh, you know we we typically try to we try to achieve at least a like a fourteen percent. Um, 14 to 15 percent cash on cash return for our investors, and typically we have to, in order to achieve that, we have to give them some kind of preferred return in addition to the uh, the cash mm-hmm. flow that we're sharing with them. But you know, but it, it, I always tell people, people that ask me about partnership structures, there there is no set way to do it. I mean, it, it really you just got to, yep. like you said, you got to sit down with your prospective partners and figure out 
what their objectives are, what yours are, make sure they align, and then just just talk it out, hash it out, find out who's going to be doing what, what the involvement's going to be, what your strengths are, what their strengths are, and then figure out what a fair arrangement is. You know, if you can arrive at a fair arrangement, great. If you can't, then then you need to find some other partners. You know, so it just because if it's not if if, if either side has any resentment going into it based on well, I don't feel like that's fully fair, but I'll go ahead and do it anyway. I promise you that's gonna that's gonna compound in a big way, you know, years down the road, and it will yeah. turn, and turn into one of those partnerships that uh, that end in divorce. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, how are you guys primarily finding your deals now? Um, do you do a lot of like direct marketing? I mean, direct mail campaigns, cold calling, or you know, are you working with real estate agents? Give me an idea of like how you find most of your deals nowadays. Yeah, so that's an interesting question. Um, in light of this this recent deal that just closed, um, you know, I think probably over the next six months or so, I'm going to look more aggressively into um, direct marketing because just because you know the, the fruit of that one letter that I sent out um, three years ago is, is incredible. Um, but uh, to date, you know, that's like I said, I've only I sent out one uh, one direct marketing letter, so I'm, I'm batting a hundred percent right now and. Uh, kind of on on a high from that, I'll probably get uh, come down off of that pretty quick. Start <laughs> off the map. I, I, um, uh, before I, it, but, before I forget, I don't mean to interrupt you. I want to actually I want to make yeah. make a point here real quick based on what you just said. I know that you said uh, that deal you just closed on it was as a result of a direct mail piece that you'd sent, and I didn't you didn't mention the time mm-hmm. frame when we started talking about that, but you just mentioned three years ago you sent that. Yeah, yeah. Th- 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 there's a reason I want to point that out is because. With direct mail, there, there's multiple different values to doing it. Number one is if you send a direct mail piece out now and there's a, an immediate motivation, more than likely it'll get a response, right? Well, a lot of people, if yeah. you send the right type of letter, I mean, if, it, if it's very personalized and you know it doesn't look like it was just a mass mail letter to a thousand different people, a lot of owners will hold on to it. You know, they'll just hold on, they'll, they'll shove it away in their drawer, they'll file it in their filing cabinet, and, and you know when the time comes because there's always the right time for someone to sell, right? Whether it's a forced motivation or it's just a, oh, I'm just kind of tired. I don't want to do this anymore. You know, but there's always the right time mm-hmm. and timing's everything with direct mail. And that guy held on to it or his family, well, he held on to it, but then his family found it. And so you basically bought that property off a of direct mail piece that was sent three years ago. That's beautiful. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's, <laughs> that's very powerful. And that, that happens time and time again. I owned a mortgage company uh, years and years ago and we used to send out, hundreds of thousands of pieces of mail every like quarter. And um, we would get calls, I mean, years and years later, people that held on to these pieces of mail. I mean, it actually, it was, a, it was a big portion of our business. We sent so many out that we had a steady stream of, of prospects calling us on a regular basis that had had the letter probably six months or more. They just held on to it. Mm-hmm. So it's, a, it's, just, it's something to think about for those out there that are thinking about doing direct mail. And another thing about direct mail is you got to be consistent with it. And, I, and I'll tell that to you as well, since you're kind of just starting down this path, is you got to be consistent with the mailings. You know, be very targeted with who you're mailing to. You know, don't just send out like a broad letter to every multifamily in Louisville. You know, know exactly who you're mailing to. Make it personalized and send out on a regular basis. You know, and send different, different types of letters, different types of media. You know, a postcard, a letter, a handwritten letter, a handwritten note. And just do it on every couple of months. Send a send a correspondence to that individual. And uh, we just had a situation that uh, we're buying a, a mobile home park in, in North Carolina. Uh, we're closing on here in a couple of weeks. And there's a couple of parks in that immediate area that we had been prospecting to for the past two years. We've been working on the deal. The deal we're closing now. We've been working on it for two years. And there's a there's like three other parks in that. Or actually, there's probably about five other parks in that general vicinity that we would like to buy. And uh, we've been prospecting and cold calling, and there was one in particular. We've we've mailed her at least five times, and we've cold called her at least three times. And I actually talked to her about two years ago, and it didn't go very well. It just she thought the property was worth way more than what we thought it was worth, and it just it just became like a mute point. And it's like, okay, well, don't think we're ever going to be able to see eye to eye, but we can we keep those people on our list because we I, what I know is that it just told me that she wasn't motivated at that point in time. She basically took my yep. phone call to see if I was a dummy that was willing to pay her more than what she also knows that property is ever going to be worth. And so, but what, what we did is I was heading up there about three weeks ago to do some due diligence on this park that we're, that we're going to be closing on. And so I basically compiled a list of, you know, I think it had, I don't know, 20 or so parks on it that were in a 20 mile radius of this park I was going to go spend time at. One of those 
parks on the list was this lady that I had mailed to five times and talked to and, you know, cold called a bunch of other times. And um, I sent her a letter basically stating like, hi, it's Kevin again. Just want to let you know, I, you know, we, we still have an interest in your property. I'm going to actually be in your in your area. Like I'm going to be right up the road, literally the park we're buying. I didn't tell her which one it was because it, I just can't really disclose it at this point. But it literally is like, it's like a half mile mm-hmm. on the road. It's almost across the street from her park. And I said, I'm going to be in the area doing due diligence on another property we're buying. And I'd love to stop by and say hi. You know, we have, we've never met in person. I know we talked one time a long time ago, but just want to chat and just, uh, I mean, say hi and let you know that we're going to be neighbors very soon. And and she actually called, or I'm sorry, she emailed me. She emailed me from that letter. And then I just picked up the phone and called her and we had a really good conversation. And I had a really good in-person meeting with her and her husband. And uh, the thing, here's the thing that changed with her. Her husband's a homicide detective and he's about to retire in three months. And um, she's uh, she's been running this park. It was actually a, a, her father built it. It was a big farm that he converted into a, a park, and she's been running this thing. And she's a it's like 120, 105 spaces, and she pretty much she doesn't do all the renovations, but I mean she does a lot of work in the park, and she's she's tired, and she wants to spend time with her husband now that he's retiring. And they have like five dogs. They're very into their dogs, and so literally her ideal life when he retires is that they can travel when they want and that they can spend as much time with their dogs as humanly possible. That's literally that's what she told me. And so what changed from two years ago till today is she now really has a a, a real motivation. I mean, there's a real motivation there. Like right. she's literally tired and she really does want to spend time with her husband. So now she's serious. Two years ago, she wasn't serious because he probably hadn't talked about retiring yet. He didn't have a set date. You know, the park was going well and the park's still going good, but she's just burned out. She's been doing it for, you know, 25 years and just, she's just tired and kind of ready for someone else to take over. So we, you know, we don't have it under contract yet, but you know, it's th- these types of, those types of relationships are very slow moving forward. And, uh, so we'll just, we'll keep, we'll keep at her and, um, keep checking in with her and, and, uh, hopefully we'll end up buying that park. But, you know, it just goes to show that direct me, if I wouldn't have, if I wouldn't have sent her that letter. I never would have probably talked to her again. She never probably would have called me when the day came that she truly wanted to sell. Someone else would have called her and they would have bought the property from her. And so mm-hmm. anyway, I, I digress. Yeah, no, I digress uh, yeah, a little bit, but that, I, I think that was a, it was a good story. I thought for, for the, yeah, no, I agree. I agree. And, and you got, so you got a chance to do something that most buyers will never have a chance to do, which is sit down face to face with her and have a human conversation. And, and I think that's, that goes a long way when they're ready to, it goes a very long way, especially if they're a mom and pop type owner and they've actually operated mm-hmm. like this one. This one's got family ties like her, her, right. her father, like built this thing with blood, sweat and tears and she took it over. And so, you know, I'm sure she gets contacted, you know, multiple. I mean, we always get mail. I know if I get mailers in the parks we own, she gets mailers on her park. So she gets contacted by all park, you know, you know these investors that want to buy parks from all over the country. But you're right. The, the in-person thing really works with the mom and pops because, to them, there's emotion attached to it. They're not just like you and I. Like you and I, at least I maybe I, I shouldn't speak for you, but like me, our properties are just our properties. Like we care for them. We, we want to. We make sure that it's a, a very safe, clean, and quiet place for the residents to live. And we're proud of our communities. But really, to us, it's an investment. Like I don't have emotional ties to it. I don't get upset if something gets damaged there. We fix it. And that's it. Like, but it doesn't like hurt yeah. my feelings if something bad happens. We just we take care of it and we move forward. But for her there's emotions attached to it. And so the face to face means everything in the world to, uh, to, to the mom and pops that have owned these things for quite some time. And like, like I said, she's been working it for 25 years, but it's in, it's been in her family forever from, from as long as she can remember. So, um, yeah, the face to face, if you can, and the, the challenge with that is you're obviously not going to go flying around the country, you know, whenever you get a, a, a potential, potential seller on the phone you don't have anything under contract you're, right. you're not going to go flying across the country just to have a, a you know a coffee with a uh, with a property owner you know it's just a waste of money and effort yeah but you know and in this scenario yeah. it, you know, so it's a good it's actually a it's a topic i'm going to cover on upcoming podcasts is if you're if you got a property under contract and it's in or if you if you're coming close to getting a property under contract in an area uh, that's outside of where you live to where you have to travel to a very powerful marketing tool is to build that list, like your top, let's say your top 50 list of the properties that are very similar to that or properties that have the criteria that you would want to buy in a 20 mile radius of that property you are going to be buying. 
and send a mailer out and, and do a cold call and let the owners know that you're coming into town that you would love to meet with them. You'll be there for an extra day and you'd love to you'll meet them face to face and and because um, you're looking to buy another property in that market. Number one, you get credibility because you're actually already buying a property in their market. And so to them, they're like, oh, well, I guess this guy really does have money and he does have the wherewithal to close. And, uh, and then plus yeah. you're going to be there in person. It, it goes a long way. So, yeah, that's a great suggestion. I like that idea. So I want to ask you a, a tough question now, Michael. I'm going to ask you to jump into your time machine. Go back in time. I know you've been you've been at this business for seven years now, and you've learned a lot along the way. You've had lots of bumps and bruises, lots of victories. But knowing what you know today, if you can go back in time, back to year one, and give yourself some advice, what would that, that advice be? Oh, man, that, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I haven't been at this long enough to, to, to be able to give myself too much advice, but... Um, uh, you know, one of the things that, that kind of built over the last four or five years that, that I kind of started to seem better in hindsight um, is that when you're when you're looking for work, you know, every every property owner has to have some type of work done, whether it's property management um, or, or dealing directly with contractors. Um, uh, what I found is you can you can really have you've got three things you're looking for. You want it fast, you want it cheap, and you want good work. Um, the problem is you can only ever have two of those at a time. <laughs> and um, it, it's it's really helpful to, to, first of all, just understand that those are kind of the three um, competing uh, metrics when you're when you're trying to get something done. Uh, but also to to really understand what which which two you really want to focus on. Um, I, I didn't really know it when you know, I didn't know what I was what I was focusing on when I started out. But um, looking back, I can tell you I was I was definitely trying to get it done cheap uh, and I was trying to get it done fast. So a lot of the, um, you know, the early, early contractors that I dealt with were, were pretty shady guys. They weren't, you know, they weren't doing top quality work. Um, and some of that stuff has, has bitten me down the road. You know, I've had to go back and spend more money fixing things that um, weren't done correctly the first time around. And then, uh, you know, as I kind of started to see that, that getting things done fast, and cheap weren't really, you know, wasn't really the, always the best way to do it. Um, I moved more into cheap and good quality, um, which, you know, worked out well, but then you're sitting there for nine months kind of twiddling your thumbs and, and, and paying uh, hard money costs while you wait for a contractor to get something done. Um, so, so now I'm kind of more in a phase where, you know, I want it done fast and I want it done um, quality work. So I'm willing to pay more for that. And uh, I think it's just, helpful to kind of understand those different dynamics and, and um, what some of the ramifications are if you, if you opt for one over the other. Yeah, no, I mean, you, you get what you pay for in this business. I mean, everyone, like you said, everyone likes a cheap price. Everyone wants to save money, but you get inferior work most of the time from it and it ends up costing you more money in the long run. So although like you, you know, something will have, you have an AC go out, you'll, your first thing you'll do is you'll go on Craigslist and, and look for the guy that's saying like, you know, you know, uh, zero, zero price estimate, you know, no cost price estimates will come out, we'll do a service call, zero money or anything like that. I mean, you'll have a guy show up in like a broken down, you know, Ford Escort or something like that. And it's kind of like, yeah, I don't know. Like he, he says he's cheap, but it shows up in his beat up car. And I'm probably going to get what I, what I pay for. I, I've had that happen a lot of times. I mean, I've gone down that road, you know, we always want to save money, but you know, you, you got, what you learn in this business and, and you, you probably learned this already because you've dealt with a lot of these people, but you learn the, you can quickly learn how to gauge the character of these individuals. And a lot of times, hopefully you can filter it out before you even have them come out. You can do it over the telephone by asking some just probing questions about their background, their experience, and even ask for some references. You know, if, if you, you found someone you think they're really cheap and inexpensive before you waste time with them to ask them for a reference or two of like maybe some work they just completed, you know, and just make a phone mm -hmm. call or two and just, just double check. That's all, you know, yeah. very, very simple things or Google their name. I mean, gosh, I mean, just simple things like Googling someone's first and last name. You know, if they've, if they've ripped people off in town before, more than likely you'll probably find it somewhere. I mean, it, it will be posted somewhere online, you know, some kind of complaint or yeah. such. So, well, Michael, now, now we uh, enter into the part of the show I like to call the golden nugget segment. And this is where we round things out for the day. But before we go, what I'd like to ask you to do is if you could just leave our audience with one last golden nugget of advice or wisdom that may inspire and help them as they progress in their real estate investing career. And this could be this could be anything from your favorite motivation quote, maybe some core principles you live by, anything you'd like. So what would that one last golden nugget be? 
Sure. So uh, I, I guess before I give you my golden nugget, I, I just wanted to uh, touch on, a, I think it was episode 96, um, and, and then maybe repeat it again in, in a later episode, but um, you had a quote from Calvin Coolidge about the, the value of persistency. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the funny thing about that is I actually printed that quote out probably about five or six years ago. Um, when, when I was in my corporate job, I printed it out, stuck it above my desk. Um, and I've kind of carried that around. It's, it's always in my desk drawer or whatever I'm using as a bookmark right now. But, um, <laughs> that, that resonated with me and, and, and I've carried it around with me. And so that, you know, I heard it on your show and I thought, man, um, this, <laughs> that, that, that's perfect. It hits home. Um, but I guess what, you know, what I would, um, kind of tell folks is, is, you know, real estate's definitely a patience game. You, you don't want to, um, be, be too aggressive or, or too, um, needy. You don't, you don't want to have to do a deal. Um, so really being able to exercise some patience, you know, understand what it is that, you know, what, if you were to get a perfect deal to come across your plate, what does that look like? Um, and then once you know what that looks like, just, you know, look for that deal. And if it's, if it's not the right deal, um, or you can't make it work then then have some patience and move on to the next one. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, when, when that perfect deal comes along, you know, don't, don't sit and ponder over it for, for a month because it's not going to be there. Somebody else is going to jump on it. So, you know, be, be patiently aggressive if that's a, if that's a, a mentality that can be exercised. Mm-hmm. No, that's great advice. And so, like for us, we have like w- what defines our perfect deals are the market that that a property is in, um, you know, the quality of the asset itself, and then also more importantly, what type of return we can achieve on our money. I mean, so we we kind of back into it as mm-hmm. long as it as long as it you know the the first couple of boxes are checked off, like the area that it's in, um, the quality of the asset itself, and then we really look hard at based on what we're going to pay for it, based on what kind of financing is available for that particular property. You know, what kind of return can we achieve today, you know, at the time of the acquisition? And then what does the upside look like? What do, what do the next five years look like? And so that's how we quickly define it. And so how about for you, Michael? Like, what do you guys look for? I mean, obviously location. So I know that you really like that one that one part of the market of Louisville. But what are the other things mm-hmm. that you look for criteria-wise that, to you, makes it a good deal? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, obviously, it, it, at the end of the day, it boils down to what um, – you know, what you're going to pay for it and what, what type of income it can generate, um, in the long run, once things are stabilized. Um, I, I don't typically assign a particular number and I don't, I don't say I need to get 20% return or, or um, something concrete that, that is kind of a, a hurdle. Um, but I really look, you know, focus on the properties that I'm looking at and, and, and there's some, a lot of boxes that I have to check on those. Um, as I mentioned before, separately metered, I'm, I'm not going to deal with something that, um, you know, I've got to, got to use rubs or, or try to collect money from tenants or, or, or charge higher rents than what the market will command, um, to cover, to cover those costs. Um, and there's, you know, there's a whole plethora of different things that I like in a building and dislike in a building. And so as I go through the list, if it checks all those boxes, then, uh, you know, I'm pretty interested at that point, and and then it's a matter of figuring out if I can make the price work with the seller, mm-hmm. um, to to where the you know the rents that are going to be coming in um, are, are going to meet my needs. And really, what I try to target, um, and, and what I'm getting with most of my properties is about $200 a unit um, in in net revenue each month. Um, so that that's kind of I guess a, a financial target, but you know, again, there's some leniency with that and. Um, you know, really boils down to, I, you know, I want to own an asset that um, I know is going to perform the way I want it to perform. And, and most of that in the multifamily business is dependent on, you know, in the small multi arena is dependent on the asset itself. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I don't go, I don't go looking for a particular yield. I, I look for a building that I want to own and then figure out if I can make it, make the yield work with the, uh, gotcha. with the seller. Okay. Yeah, that's that's great advice. Well, well, fantastic. Well, Michael, it's been a been a pleasure having you on the show. I've I've learned a lot, and our listeners have learned a lot. And um, for those that want to learn more about Michael and his business, they can go visit him on his website, which is renting five zero two dot com. Again, that's renting five zero two dot com. And Michael, do you did you want to share any other way for them to reach you? I, I know you have another website as well. And or so, would you like me to share that? Would you like to share that or your email if you'd like? Yeah, yeah. If anybody wants to get a hold of me, you're welcome to uh, shoot me an email directly. 
Um, my personal email address is michael at renting502.com. Um, I'm, I'm on my email 24 seven. So, uh, I'm more than happy to, to interact with folks, help out, um, whatever, whatever I can do. So drop me a line. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. So those of you that are actually in the Louisville market, I know we have a big listener base in Kentucky. So, uh, if you're out there and you're doing deals and you run across some opportunities that you think Michael might be interested in, then you'll know how to reach them. So Michael, that's all we have for today. It's been a lot of fun. I appreciate you coming to the show and, um, you know, best of luck to you and everything that you do. And I look forward to keeping in touch, my friend, you take care and have a great week. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Have a good week too. Congratulations. Now you've got more of the best tricks of the trade in building massive amounts of passive income from real estate. For more amazing resources, visit realestateinvestingforcashflow.com. We'll see you next Monday morning.